It's the real news. I'm Aaron Maté. This week, the White House admitted President Trump had a second undisclosed conversation with Vladimir Putin at the G20 in Germany. That disclosure set off a media frenzy, as is the norm these days with anything to do with Russia. Now, speaking to the New York Times, Trump discussed his conversation with Putin. Really pleasantries more than anything else. Uh, was not a long conversation, but it was, you know, it could be 15 minutes, just talked about mm -hmm. things. Uh, we Actually, it was very interesting. We talked about adoption. Mm -hmm. You did? Russian adoption, yeah. Mm -hmm. I always found that interesting because, you know, he ended that years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I actually talked about Russian adoption with him, which is interesting mm -hmm. because that was a part of the conversation that Don had with this right. meeting that I think, as I said, most other people, you know, when they call up and they say, by the way, we have information on your opponent. Mm -hmm. I think most politicians, I was just with a lot of people, they said, who wouldn't have taken a meeting like that? Trump's mention of his son Don Jr.'s meeting refers to another media obsession, his son Donald Jr.'s uh, meeting with a Russian lawyer. A music publicist named Rob Goldstone told Donald Jr. the lawyer had compromising information on Hillary Clinton to provide him on behalf of the Russian government. Matt Taibbi is a journalist, Rolling Stone contributor, and author of several books, including his latest, Insane Clown President. Matt, welcome. How's it going? All right, so I want to start off by saying that I think it's difficult to have a sober conversation about Russia these days, uh, given that there's such an underlying assumption in media coverage that any dealings with Russians, any conversations with Russians uh, are likely nefarious or at least uh, questionable. But I think we should attempt to try to try to break down some of these stories here. And let's start with what Trump was talking about in that clip there from The Times. Uh, he's referring to Donald Trump's, uh, Donald Trump Jr.'s meeting with the Russian lawyer and also his uh, conversation with Putin. Uh, likely about the Magnitsky Act. And you write in your latest piece for Rolling Stone that there's no way to understand what's going on right now uh, without first understanding the Magnitsky affair. Can you explain it for us? Sure. Well, first of all, just backing up, if you remember uh, the Romney-Obama race uh, of 2012, you might remember this moment in the, in the debate when Romney said that Russia was the greatest uh, threat that we face today, and Obama responded that the you know the 80s want their foreign policy back, or the 80s call they want their foreign foreign, foreign policy back. So at that time, it, it was the consensus, really in both parties, that that Russia was not a grave geopolitical threat. Um, but uh, interestingly, just a few months after that moment, after that debate. Um, uh, Obama signed into law this, this thing called the Magnitsky Act, which set in motion a series of events uh, that, I, you know, in my opinion, precipitated the steep collapse uh, of Russian-American relations. And the Magnitsky Act, it's, it's complicated, but essentially it's a response to an incident involving an American billionaire named Bill Browder, uh, who had um, a couple of companies raided by uh, some Russian thugs. Um, and one of Browder's employees was in prison, this guy, Sergei Magnitsky, he died in prison, and the United States retaliated by uh, creating a, a regime of human rights sanctions uh, that they called the Magnitsky Act. And the Russians were very offended by this act uh, because they believed that it singled out Russia um, as, as, a, as a human rights abuser when, of course, they exist all over the planet, and they retaliated by banning uh, adoptions of American children, and that sort of led, snowballed and led to the to the uh, awful relations that we have now. You know, Matt, um, you mentioned uh, that 2012 debate between, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, 2012 debate between uh, Romney and Obama, uh, and the mood there at the time from the Democrats is being quite different than now. Glenn Greenwald recently uh, tweeted out uh, a tweet from the Democratic Party from back then, and he said, I think this is my favorite tweet in the history of Twitter, because it said from the Democrats, Romney, who calls Russia our number one geopolitical foe, doesn't seem to realize it's the 21st century. Hashtag Romney, not Romney. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> as you note, a very different tone uh, than we're seeing now. Yeah. 
Well, no, I mean, just, just to comment on that quickly, you know, again, I, I lived in Russia for 11 years. I was there uh, when, uh, during the transfer of power from Boris Yeltsin to, to Vladimir Putin. And this, all these different iterations of attitudes towards uh, toward the, the Putin regime are kind of mystifying, you know, for, for, for the people, for those of us who live there. Uh, and, you know, I was an early critic of the Putin regime. Most of us have kind of had the same attitude towards Putin throughout. We, we've all sort of thought he was a, a dangerous autocrat uh, who, who was a human rights abuser. But then again, so was his predecessor, Boris Yeltsin. Um, but the, the attitude towards Putin from the political consensus in this country is what's changed. He's, he's been the same basically nefarious character throughout. It's just that, uh, you know, back in 2012, the Democrats didn't mind him so much, and now they do. And, uh, and it's, it's just interesting, that shift in attitudes. Okay, and so on the Magnitsky Act, uh, you note in your piece that um, you had a similar experience to what Donald Jr. described as being the outcome of the meeting. He says he thought it was inconsequential because uh, they were promising some damaging information on Clinton, but really all they wanted to talk about was these sanctions. And you had a, a, a similar experience, right? Yeah, so I, I, I tried to interview one of the people who was involved with this company, Prevazon. Um, the, the lawyer in this case, who was in that, in that meeting with Donald, uh, Donald Jr., this woman, Natalia Veselinskaya, she's the lawyer for a company uh, called Prevazon, which is a Cypriot-based company run by this guy named Denis Katsiv. Uh, Katsiv uh, is the defendant, or was the defendant, in a money laundering, a federal money, money laundering case, again, involving that whole Browder affair uh, that we talked about before. Um, and I tried to interview those people, uh, and... Uh, because I was interested in the fact that they that uh, Prevazon had also hired Fusion GPS, which is the same company uh, that that commissioned the Steele report. I just thought that was a very odd coincidence, and I wanted to find out what was going on there. I sort of thought maybe I could get a little bit uh, of information about the origins of the Steele report. But when I uh, when I met with these with these folks. Um, they they kind of led me to believe that they were going to give me some information on that, and then when I met with them, they just went straight into their pitch about about the Magnitsky Act, which is a very uh, ugly kind of pitch, by the way. Essentially, what they're what they're saying is, if if we repeal the Magnitsky Act, they'll repeal their adoption ban, which is a uh, you know a, a fancy way of saying that they're holding kids hostage to this political crisis. So. Again, I, I had this, the same kind of this experience that Donald Trump Jr. did. He thought he was getting one thing, and he's, essentially he got this, this kind of uh, ridiculous pitch on, about Magnitsky. And just to clarify for people, the uh, Steele memo that Matt mentioned, that was this um, dossier, this infamous dossier, uh, commissioned initially by Trump's Republican opponents, but then also, uh, um, also paid for by some Democrats in an attempt to find damaging information on Donald Trump. Incidentally, using information that came from Russia, um, which Trump himself has been accused of doing towards Hillary Clinton. Right, yeah, exactly. I mean, look, the, the distinction, it, to play devil's advocate, what, what I think people would say the distinction is, is that, um, you know, here you had a Russian a uh, person who may or may not have been a cutout for uh, higher-ranking officials in the Russian government. We don't have any evidence for that. Um, who was offering compromising information. And whether or not they delivered is an open question. It's not clear. Um, but I think what the Democrats would say is that, you know, the, the Fusion GPS and, and Christopher Steele, that they were I guess, digging for information as opposed to passively receiving it. I'm not really sure what the distinction is because, um, you know, the, the argument currently is, is that Trump violated campaign finance laws by accepting something of value from uh, a foreign government. But in the case of the Steele report, we know that they actually paid for information uh, that came from Russia. So uh, we know it has concrete value in that case. So uh, it, it, it is an odd thing. Uh, I, I understand why people are, are, are outraged by one and not by the other, but, you know, from a technical standpoint, it, it, it is kind of the same thing. Okay, and can we talk uh, a bit more about um, some of the characters that were at this Donald Trump Jr. meeting? Because 
There's I, some comedy in it, right? I mean, when the disclosure first came out that that Donald Jr. had this meeting, it was this big revelation. And my thinking was, okay, all right, well, at least for the first time, we have something. We have some a piece of material. I don't know if I can call it evidence, but it's something. There's an email that says that a Trump campaign member received, Donald Jr., saying that there is a Russian government effort to elect his father. But then we have to look at who the email comes from. It's a music publicist named Rob Goldstone. And it's just hard to believe that someone like this guy and some of the others who were there could be involved in a high-level Kremlin intrigue. Yeah, you know, and Goldstone it was is basically like, you know, the promoter for this third-rate, uh, I believe, Georgian pop star who uh, became acquainted with Trump during the Miss Universe pageant. Um, it, 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 I get it. Definitely uh, seems a little bit odd to imagine that that would be the Kremlin's route to uh, to trying to solicit or recruit. Donald Trump Jr., Jr., I think if they were going to really do it in earnest, they would go through people who are a little bit more discreet. Uh, but then again, you know, you, you never know. But the whole thing is, is exceedingly strange. Um, you know, I, I don't think the normal uh, stagecraft in international espionage involves sending a letter that says, you know, if you would like to receive, uh, you know, the bounty of our state-sponsored effort to help your father win an election, please respond in writing. I just... That's not the way I think it would normally work. And this character, Goldstone, is a real goofball. Um, and these Prevazan characters are also real goofballs. I mean, they're, from what I understand, they're real kind of third-rate provincial uh, goons. That doesn't mean necessarily automatically that they're not somehow in league with the Kremlin. But in, in my mind, and in, you know, get, get, from my experience living over there, I, they just don't seem like exactly the type. It's possible, but it, but you know it's unlikely to me. Yeah, and the reaction was just striking to me, uh, seeing it just as the smoking gun. Uh, I saw one progressive outlet use that term, calling Goldstone's email the smoking gun. Rachel Maddow on her show, uh, she said that night after the meeting came out, she said about the Trump campaign, they're confessing to colluding with Russians during the campaign. So it's been taken as this... Um, Definitive proof. But, man, let me ask you about uh, this uh, new revelation this week about the uh, Trump-Putin conversation uh, at the G20. So uh, a few weeks after the G20 happens, the White House comes out and admits that Trump and Putin spoke at this dinner. Um, there's some dispute about how long the conversation was. One report said it was close to an hour. Trump says it was 15 minutes. What do you make of it? I don't know what to make of it. I mean... It because there's no official record of conversation, you know, who knows what was said at it. I find it highly likely to, highly unlikely that anything too nefarious went on, um, you know, in full view of some of the, some of, of all these world leaders. Um, I, I think the more significant uh, uh, thing about that story, number one, I think it demonstrates, and you, you saw there was some film release of Trump trying to get Putin's attention during during the dinner. Um, we also we also um, you know, know know that he went out of his way to, to sort of brace up Putin after this event, and it's not clear that Putin this was welcome to Putin. It, it more shows that that this Trump has this bizarre, possibly unrequited uh, affection for for um, for for Putin, and, and this isn't the first time that this happened. Uh, uh, George W. Bush also had a similar fascination. With Putin and, and he looked into he, his soul. He looked into his soul, which was which was so ridiculous uh, that the, the, these two groups of people couldn't possibly be more different. I mean, Trump Trump is a self made criminal mastermind who who kind of rose from nothing to to, to get to the top of the world's toughest gangster state, and and both Trump and, and Bush are the pampered scions of of uh, inherited wealth uh, who had every path cleared for them and. They have nothing in common, but it's interesting that, that, that both of these figures have such a fascination with Putin. And, and I think that's what real, more with that story shows. Yeah, you know, in my mind, the most likely connection between Trump and Russia, if there is one, has always been about finances, right? Because of that's the part of his, his world that is the most uh, murky and, and shady, and it, which he's been so secretive about. Um, 
Now, putting aside the question of, of whether dealings with Russia are uniquely nefarious, because, of course, there's oligarchs not just in Russia. There's shady people all over the world. But what do you make of the financial dimension of uh, the Trump-Russia story? I, everybody I know, again, I, I have lots and lots of friends who either are still working in Russia or used to work in Russia or, um, you know, we, we all think that if, if there's a connection, that's the most likely place there would be one. It, it's, it's a natural marriage. Look, you have a whole country full of uh, gangland characters who are looking for a place to store uh, their hot capital uh, and to stash it abroad. And the most likely place to do that, the best place to do that, is in foreign real estate. Uh, and so it's a natural marriage, you know, oligarchs and, and characters like Donald Trump. That would be totally believable to me. If that, if that were the original thesis of Russiagate, I would never have had a problem with it. I would, I would never have been skeptical about it. The part that always seemed strange to me was this, this cloak and dagger uh, narrative wherein the Russians hack the DNC and somehow this is a quid pro quo for policy where they include uh, Donald Trump, who's this famously indiscreet, uh, indiscreet idiot. Um, there's, there would just be no upside in my mind to, to include Trump in that plot. I'm not saying it's impossible, but that's far less likely than, than, than the much more likely scenario of just money looking for a home to be laundered and finding a New York real estate magnate. That, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, Matt, so listen, correct me if you think I'm going too far here, okay? But I want to put out there that, in my mind, the most tangible case of potential conflict of interest when it comes to uh, candidates in the 2016 campaign and Russia is actually Hillary Clinton. And here's why I say that. So these Magnitsky sanctions, sanctions that we've been talking about, Clinton opposed them when she was Secretary of State. And her opposition to the sanctions coincided with her husband, Bill Clinton, going to Moscow to deliver a speech to Renaissance Capital, which is a Russian investment firm, and getting paid $500,000. And we know later from WikiLeaks that uh, one of their emails, Clinton's 2016 campaign killed a story by Bloomberg that was trying to link Clinton's stance, Hillary Clinton's stance, to her husband's appearance. And I'm just going to quote from the email. This is uh, from the hacked emails of the Clinton campaign released by WikiLeaks. It says, with the help of the research team, we killed a Bloomberg story trying to link Hillary Clinton's opposition to the Magnitsky Act bill to a $500,000 speech that Bill Clinton gave in Moscow. And just one more thing, the London Telegraph recently reported that more than six million pounds from funds at the center of the fraud that Magnitsky uh, supposedly uncovered um, and was investigating has allegedly been traced to a bank account held by Renaissance Capital. Right. So <laughs> is it possible there that, Ren and we know that Renaissance Capital was opposed to these sanctions, and so Hillary Clinton comes out against the sanctions right at the time that Renaissance pays Bill Clinton $500,000. That to me, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is more tangible than anything we've seen about Trump so far. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about this last week. Uh, you know, this clearly all that happened. Um, you know, Magnitsky himself, if I remember correctly, pointed a finger at Renaissance Capital. Um, and, you know, the, the story that you cite by The Telegraph, uh, there have been indications that RenCap was, was part of the original Magnitsky fraud. So that whole sequence of events, it definitely smells bad. Um, I think if it were Donald Trump uh, who had accepted that money and, and who had subsequently came out against the Magnitsky Act, um, it would be leading, leading the headlines in a lot of news stories right now. Uh, you know, conversely, it's interesting that Trump um, never opposed the Magnitsky Act. In fact, he did the opposite. He, he has come out and uh, been in favor of expanding the Magnitsky Act, uh, you know, gl globally. Um, on the other hand, I think one has to point out that, the, that Trump fired uh, the, the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York who was prosecuting the Prevazan case and that the replacement um, gave a very favorable settlement to the people in that case. 
uh, to, in other words, to the people who met with Donald Trump Jr. Um, but you're right. I mean, look, the, that, that whole sequence of events with Renaissance Capital and, and the Magnitsky Act, and let's not forget that, that Barack Obama also um, originally opposed the, the Magnitsky Act uh, before signing it, ultimately. Um, you know, it's, it's odd. You, 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 could, you could argue that this was part and parcel of the Obama administration's original desire to have what they called the reset with Russia. Um, you know, through the, the lens of that, uh, the Magnitsky Act was definitely a huge problem because they couldn't have any reset if they were going to pass this law. Um, but yeah, it looks bad. There's no question. All right. So finally, Matt, um, if we could end by talking about the uh, liberal media and political culture we're seeing right now uh, around Russia and what that portends for Democrats' future, which is a topic that you've written about. Um, I want to play a clip uh, from Rachel Maddow's show the other night, uh, where she's talking about, um, well, what Putin may have gotten out of Trump. If Russia decided to interfere with our presidential election because they wanted something, uh, because they wanted to change the world so it's more like what they want, what are the things they want that they might try to get from the United States? What, what could they conceivably get from the United States if they could wave a magic wand? And have they been getting any of it? Um, this was our first back-of-the-envelope calculation, uh, our first guess at what might be a, a Russia wish list. Russia might like the United States to be isolated in the world uh, and the West to be fractured. They certainly want to be released from U.S. sanctions, which they hate. They would definitely like deciding power over what happens in Syria. They see that as their footprint in the Middle East. Um, Russia has resented for years, for decades, what they see as uh, the meddling of the U.S. State Department in their affairs. I'm sure they'd like to hit the State Department with a big freeze ray to sort of render the U.S. State Department inert. And for our radio audience who, who, who can't see the visual there, uh, Maddow is saying this in front of a, a screen that says, Russia wish list update. And all the items that she talked about are there. Isolate the US, a fractured West, release from US sanctions, deciding power in Syria, and so on. And um, continuing on this theme, um, Matt, I want to quote for you a tweet recently from Donna Brazil, the former chair of the DNC. Uh, after Russia recently asked for its diplomatic compounds back, uh, back that were seized by the Obama administration um, in retaliation, it said, for alleged Russian hacking, uh, Donna Brazil tweeted out, the communists are now dictating the terms of the debate. So Matt, if you could comment on all this and your thoughts on this uh, focus by Democrats in, in the political and media class. Yeah, I'm actually writing a column about this right now. It's 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 bizarre. Um, you know, look from the media standpoint, I think what people have to understand is that a lot of this is about money. Uh, the Russia story uh, sells incredibly well, um, and cable networks that traditionally have not made a lot of money are making a lot of money with the story. Um, and so, I I understand that the relentless emphasis on the Russia story makes a lot of sense from the network's point of view because it, it creates uh, uh, among viewers this impression that the fate of the nation, you know, may be decided any minute. You know, this, is, this is like they're selling it as a kind of Watergate uh, sequel. Um, and so you have to tune in every night, not just an election that you have to keep tuning in. Um, so that, uh, I almost understand it more coming from the media. It's, it's, it's the political class that I understand less because they're, they're sort of relentless emphasis on this Russia story is a huge bet uh, that I, I don't know whether it's going to pay off. I think they, they have to, they're doing this at the expense of making a cogent argument um, on policy grounds against Trump. And they're, they're also um, forcing the, the resistance to be synonymous with this Russia story. So in order, in order for the resistance to, to have meaning, um, it, the conspiracy has to be true, uh, which, you know, it, it would make a lot more sense if, if there was a, a resistance that was based upon, you know, opposition to Trump's health care policies or his environmental views or, you know, all of which are totally repugnant. Um, I, you know, we've seen poll numbers consistently throughout the last 
uh, six or seven months, that Democratic voters just aren't as excited about this uh, policy-wise um, as the party is. The party is much more obsessed with this than uh, their voters are. Uh, from a media standpoint of view, point, again, I understand it because people will tune in, but I don't, I don't think that they, that politically it's necessarily a smart move uh, to do what they're doing because, um, you know, they have, Democrats, if there's one thing that's been clear about the election and what happened last year is that they have to reinvent themselves. They have to find a new way to talk to America. And the Russia story is, is just, it's just delaying that process in my mind. Um, and... Uh, sooner or later, they're going to have to have something else to talk about, and it's 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 odd that they're they're retreating so quickly to this sort of neo cold war thing. And, and you know, the Donna Brazil quote is amazing. It just shows that the, the, you know they don't even differentiate between the Soviet Union and and modern Russia, and that they've they've missed you know maybe thirty years of history in between, uh, and they're oversimplifying things. So it's it's a very strange thing. Yeah, Matt, so strange, I just want to say, that it means joining forces with, uh, as James Carden and Glenn Greenwald have pointed out in recent pieces, joining forces with neocons, like David Frum. Right. Yeah, no, and, and uh, look, the, the, the backstory to this whole Russiagate thing has been this growing consolidation of attitudes, um, you know, the opposition to this kind of reset or rapprochement that both Barack Obama and, to I think, to some extent, Vladimir Putin wanted back in 2009, 10, and 11. Um, you know, there was always opposition to this, and it, it always existed both within the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party. And I think that's part of the backdrop uh, for this Russiagate thing. You know, in my mind, originally the Magnitsky Act was the way that uh, opposition to this kind of thaw in relations between the two countries, that was how it originally coalesced. But now Russiagate has replaced the Magnitsky Act, and that's where, you know, the neocons are joining up with hardliners in the Democratic Party. And people have to understand that there's, there's an enormous incentive on both sides uh, for, you know, this hardening of relations because it means more spending on the military, more spending on espionage, more spending on security. Um, you know, the, the countries never were really comfortable with each other as friends, uh, and they got used to this, this, to being enemies with each other. And, and you know, institutionally, there's, there's momentum in that direction, and that's a factor in this whole story. Matt Taibbi, journalist, Rolling Stone contributor, and author of several books, including Insane Clown President. Matt, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Eric. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.